It was a creed written into the founding documents that declared the destiny of a nation. Yes, we can. It was whispered by slaves and abolitionists as they blazed the trail toward freedom. Yes, we can. Yes, we can. It was sung. It was sung by immigrants as they struck out the distant shore of pioneers who pushed westward against an unforgiving wilderness. Yes, we can. Yes, we can. It was the call of workers organized, women who reached for the ballots. A president who chose the moon as our new frontier And a king who took us to the mountaintop And pointed the way to the promised land Yes, we can to justice and equality Yes, we can 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 to opportunity and prosperity. Yes, we can to opportunity and prosperity. Yes, we can heal this nation. Heal this nation. Yes, we can repair this world. Yes, we can. 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 Yes 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 we can. From WBR and Radio and the Boston Red Network, the title of our episode: the 2018 election preview. We've been working on this for a number of days now. Uh, well, I actually since uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, uh, and these various primaries around the country from Missouri, the Show Me State, to uh, Michigan, and the projection there, the Bernie uh, Sanders uh, candidate, uh, Rashina uh, Tlaibbi there, and uh, to Ohio, the uh, Ohio 19, I believe it is, uh, what has happened there, the election has not been called there, Mr. O'Connor versus the Republican endorsed uh, by uh, D.J. Trump. We'll look at this. We'll look at the Trump uh, factor. And this is in these very red uh, districts. Now, Missouri, right to work in Missouri. You've had a cookie-cutter of patterns for that recently. Michigan on the Gateway Snyder. They turned the UAW state into a right-to-work state. Did not happen in Michigan. In Michigan, a state that has uh, two large uh, cities being... uh, Kansas City and uh, St. Louis and then much of the rural area uh, there whereas uh, in uh, Michigan you had the city of Detroit and the suburban areas uh, surrounding Detroit and the uh, state of the Democratic Party in the state of Michigan D.J. Trump carried Michigan by roughly about uh, 20,000 or so votes between Michigan and Pennsylvania in Wisconsin, there were 80,000 votes in the circumference, about that, which is not of a lot of votes out of millions of people. But what has happened in this particular cycle as we go into 2018, progressives have been organizing block by block, literally. Down in St. Louis County, a new prosecutor there, McCullough, the old prosecutor, almost there for 30 years, has been ousted and ousted handily by a municipal judge uh, uh, slash public defender. So that is the outgrowth of many things. Uh, Grassroots campaigning there, 50,000 handwritten postcards put out there. And the uh, Michael Brown murder there in uh, St. Louis uh, County down in uh, Ferguson. All those things weighed in. The man that won the race is out of Ferguson, Missouri. And that whole area there in uh, St. Louis uh, County, things have uh, changed. And that will have an effect on the race uh, with uh, Claire McCastle. Claire McCastle is a senator from uh, Missouri. And they've had various other machinations. The governor there, Giddens, uh, uh, 
Giddens had uh, been um, forced to resign in a scandal there. So the Republican Party in uh, Missouri has been uh, rocked. No amount of posturing uh, by uh, D.J. Trump will be able to cure this particular phenomenon. And the Republicans, uh, this district, uh, skipping around here a bit, 19 that is in uh, out of uh, around Columbus, Danny O'Connor, a good Irish name, was endorsed uh, by the uh, Columbus Dis- uh, Dispatch. It was the Dayton Dispatch. <coughs> anyway, nonetheless, these relatively conservative papers there have moved in a different direction. And they're still counting provisional ballots there, etc. And this this is a special election. Now, the same thing happened in uh, Detroit area uh, for the seat of uh, the uh, great um, John Conyers Jr. Ms. Jones, who is the uh, direct is the head of the uh, Detroit City Council, won that seat for 18 days. Now she has to decide to give up the presidency of the city council to take the 18-day assignment. Now, um, Rashina, Rahina, Rashina, uh, she won the, uh, she'll be uh, sworn in in January, so she'll get two-year term there. And the vote was all split up. We'll talk a little bit about that, uh, the machinations of there and a little about uh, Ben Jealous, the campaign in uh, Maryland for governor. The governor there, Hogan, in desperation, was calling uh, Jealous a socialist. Well, the problem is Ben Jealous is uh, venture capitalist, former head of the NACP. And when you get into being a venture capitalist, by definition, you're not a socialist. But we have to work with what we work with these days, uh, Ben Jealous being progressive otherwise to fix the health care system in Maryland, develop uh, more jobs in Maryland. And also we'll uh, talk just briefly here about the state of emergency in Virginia. Ref Norfin, he's the governor of Virginia, has called a state of emergency. The, the anniversary is coming up this weekend of the killing of Heather Heyer, and we always honor her death by these uh, murderers in the city of Charlottesville, uh, Virginia, and also the city of Charlottesville. So they've already called the emergencies, uh, emergency situation. That way they can bring in more uh, law enforcement uh, types, a thousand or so of those. They've closed streets, etc. This is not a smart move uh, by the alt-right uh, coalition to commemorate that. The same thing is happening in uh, Washington. Grassroots organizations are taking... Uh, uh, to the streets to counter protests. The same thing happened out in uh, Portland, Oregon. A different situation. There was an article by uh, George Will talking about the racist nature of Oregon. There's no doubt about that. So these groups, uh, the Patriots, whatever they call themselves, are homegrown in Oregon. Out of uh, the hills and mountains uh, of Oregon come these people. There is a native nativist uh, movement in Oregon, in around uh, Portland, these attacks. This is what we call working around the edges. They've come to um, the attention now of a national audience. And uh, that can be uh, brought to D.J. Trump and his administration, where they've actually boosted uh, people's awareness and people's uh, fight back, the resistance. The resistance itself, you get Dan Rabbit in there, uh, Rev Native, various of the old timers have come into this resistance. Professor uh, Rush out of uh, Berkeley, and many, many others that have um, set up uh, sites, done videos, and videos on um, internet radio, podcasts, all these things going on. And at the same time, the demise of the ultra-right uh, criminal um, Jones, uh, Alex Jones. Some of his things have been taken down. Now, this is a prelude to what is going on out here. The reason these social media organizations have been hesitant, they've all had these rules in place, hesitant to do this is because of the profit-making a part of it. 
but now it has uh, come down and uh, you're starting to see this is uh, what happened to the uh, Daily Storm and when they lost their hosting and they lost their place. You don't hear the Daily Storm anymore. They were on a Russian site um, and you don't hear these but this whole inner structure you have to look at why was it necessary in the first place. Well this inner structure they were able to use it to persuade elements of the uh, Trump coalition to support uh, DJ Trump. The border is one big uh, situation there. Build a wall at the cost of what is $25 billion, a lot of money involved there. But the numbers of people interdicted at the border, and that's a very large border. We're talking about way over a thousand miles stretches from Texas to Baja, California, and Arizona in between. So you're talking about the large border, and you have basically two elements. People that are coming for political asylum, a smaller number. People are coming for economic advantage. Now, the people that are coming, they've had raids, incidentally, in the uh, Midwest, in Nebraska uh, and uh, Minnesota, where they've uh, collected up uh, roughly about 150 people but involved a little different situation, a conspiracy uh, by some of these criminal gangs. They have people uh, cash their checks. They took out withholding, etc. And it was not passed on to the federal government. A little different twist there. But ultimately, these people that were picked up from these various small businesses, who will replace them? It's the viability of many of these small businesses. And that is an answer. And also the interdiction at the border. Who will replace these people? People have not thought about that. Uh, So in other words, those are so-called employment opportunities that will not uh, be uh, taken up um, by many of the locals. That I don't want the job, can't do the job, or the job is not available to them. So it's a little bit more than what one would think. It's sort of like the tariffs uh, that are out there on steel, uh, aluminum, aluminum, etc., what you want to call it, the 25%er. The big uh, steel companies, U.S. Steel, etc., have objected to uh, uh, objections from the smaller roll steel types that would like to be excluded from this tariff. And they have succeeded and the small ones have not. So those people eventually are laying people off. So you create 1,000 jobs, 2,000 jobs in U.S. Steel, and then you lose 5,000 jobs over a a period of months from these uh, small-time operations, which, uh, generally speaking, hurt these smaller uh, rural communities. So you have that dynamic uh, coming up here when you start talking about the jobs, and it starts to filter in. For example, in uh, the information... uh, technology sector, IBM and some others are literally uh, increasing the uh, charge that they uh, charge uh, data centers, etc. for various components in anticipation of the situation. So what happens is those uh, and those and that cost will be passed on. Not only will the data centers have to up their uh, charges, the cloud, so to speak, you have other people that will be caught by this uh, small uh, operations that build custom servers, etc. People that buy any type of components, including the Raspberry Pi, will be uh, paying a more. And this is the reality of what is going on. Let me go to a little bit of a roundup here. This is from the Uplift at the New York Times. It, uh, the Michigan race, it has it. I believe it also has Missouri in Ohio. We'll just hear a little bit of this, and then we'll be back to our part. Hold on. It's a 10-minute break from WBRN, an internet radio organization. Here we go. From the I will uplift you in so many ways, not only through service, but fighting back against every single oppressive racist structure that needs to be dismantled because you deserve better.
Machine is the daughter of a Palestinian immigrant. It's fundamentally unconstitutional and simply un-American to promote uh, the targeting of uh, those of a certain faith. And she's on a post in November, so she is elected as Rashina. America is on the right path. The results of the highly watched special election in Ohio's 12th. This is the Ohio's 12th congressional district is still too close to call. While Republican Troy Balderson holds a slim lead over Democrat Danny O'Connor, thousands of provisional ballots are still left to be counted. We went door to door. We went house to house. We made our case for change. But why did the Republican Party have to fight so hard to defend its 38-year hold on this House seat? First, let's look at the Trump effect. The 12th District has traditionally been represented by moderate, business-minded Republicans, like Pat Tiberi. Burdensome regulations and a broken tax code keep American businesses from hiring. But it doesn't have to be that way. But Balderson embraced the populist tone of Trump, a highly non-traditional Republican. I'll end sanctuary cities to stop illegals from taking our jobs. Fight alongside Trump to implement his agenda and use conservative grit to build the darn wall. This was also a year when Republicans fought complacency. To try and motivate voters, outside Republican groups opted for polarizing messaging. The liberal resistance is demanding open borders, opening America's doors to more crime and drugs. Danny O'Connor would join the resistance. Republican groups poured more than $3.7 million into the race, spending five times as much as the Democrats. Dishonest Danny would vote with Pelosi to raise our taxes. Republicans even pride a late endorsement from Governor John Kasich, a Trump critic. Troy shares our common sense values on the important issues that face us today. Now let's look at the Democrats. Danny O'Connor positioned himself as part of the blue wave. We need new leadership in both parties. And instead of corporate giveaways that pile up debt, let's cut taxes for working people. O'Connor also got an unanticipated boost when the traditionally conservative editorial page of the Columbus Dispatch endorsed him. So even though Balderson may win this special election, he'll have to once again face off against O'Connor in November. This is the same scenario uh, that's happened in a number of these. You have the uh, this particular situation, then you move on uh, to the next uh, situation. Let me just check here um, okay we won't worry about Alex Jones we'll leave Mr. Jones uh, behind but on to Missouri a little wrap up here on the uh, election in uh, St. Louis County of the uh, prosecutor there and hopefully we can get this piece up here This prosecutor had been in place uh, for almost 40 years, uh, 38 years, elected in 1990. It's a long time ago. And he was uh, handily uh, defeated uh, there uh, uh, by this gentleman. And let me just get this piece up here. At SSM Health, Cardinal Glennon Children's Hospital, our patients and families often talk about the Glennon Factor, what Glennon gives to our patients. Glennon gives hope for a new day, healing in time of oh, illness. Sorry, let me skip the head here. Here we go. Political Fix. Welcome to Political Fix. I'm Christopher Ave, the national and political editor at the St. Louis Post-Dispatch. I'm joined today by Joel Courier, a court reporter here at the Post, and we are talking about the biggest upset on Tuesday night's uh, ballots, at least in the St. Louis region, and that is for St. Louis County Prosecutor. So, Joel, tell us what happened on election night. Well, this was a Democratic primary. Uh, between challenger Wesley Bell and longtime incumbent Robert McCullough. He's been the St. Louis County prosecutor for since 1990, essentially, mm. when he won the Democratic primary back then. 
he's really never had much opposition in all those years uh, until uh, yesterday, until these last few months. Um, it's the first time he's really had a challenger since Ferguson uh, in the uprising over the shooting of Michael Brown. Um, and Wesley Bell um, really won handily against uh, Robert McCullough. It took a lot of people by, by surprise. Um, even some people in McCullough's office have said they're just stunned uh, that this happened. So, hmm. um, yeah, there's, uh, there's a thought that Wesley Bell success kind of comes on the coattails of Ferguson, but he says it's much broader than that. He says it's his campaign was grassroots. Um, he's had a lot of volunteers working for him, sending out, he said, 51,000 handwritten postcards, uh, hmm. which obviously takes a lot of work and people uh, who are engaged. Yeah, it's a little, little harder than the robocalls or the robo-text right. messages that <laughs> yeah. voters are getting recently. Now, what about uh, McCullough? Do you get the sense that he took this uh, election seriously, that he threw himself into it 100%? Well, I've talked to some political scholars today about that, and there is a sense that maybe he didn't take Wesley's campaign too seriously, that mm. he was comfortable having been in the same seat for, you know, almost three decades, and that, uh, you know, given, given Wesley Bell's relative inexperience as a, as a county prosecutor, um, he just didn't, he didn't think he was a competitive rival. Right. Now, you cover courts. You know all about prosecutors and the prosecution of cases. Wesley Bell, although he's been a municipal judge, he's not been a prosecutor, not prosecuted a felony case uh, in his career. So tell us a little bit about how that might or might not affect uh, this change where he will be running the office of the prosecutor for the county. Right. Now, he has been a, a municipal prosecutor okay. in Riverview, but... You're right when he hasn't. When you say he hasn't prosecuted a felony case, mm -hmm. he's been a public defender uh, in his first couple of years out of law school. So uh, he has uh, defended people in felony cases, but he he's also spent some time as a municipal judge in Belda City. Um, but you know his critics say that he's he's up for a huge challenge and that he's never uh, run an office of this size uh, and you know never really prosecuted a felony case, as you say. So. Um, he's going to, pr they're saying that he's got a learning curve, and uh, there may be a uh, transition there that'll take some time. Fascinating. Thanks, Joel. Uh, again. Now, let me clean up uh, some of this. Uh, this is usually what the situation is. First of all, the head prosecutor in a county like uh, St. Louis County rarely personally prosecutes a case. They leave that to an assistant that is one that has prosecuted many, many, many cases. The same goes for administration. The head prosecutor is the head administrator, but there are numerous other administrators there. And during the transition, they will no doubt uh, get together a general staff. They will probably keep some of McCullough's people on that have been there for many years. Others will, will, will disappear. And there will be a different uh, ideological... Uh, for us, let's say that. But these are things that happen uh, nonetheless. You hear in other types of campaigns, uh, we were looking at a campaign in Minnesota where a person that had been a leader in the Minnesota legislature was running in Keith Ellison's old district saying that the experience, but the experience in the Congress is totally different from being in a state legislature. For one, you have 436 different individuals to deal with there and you're dealing on a national level. There are uh, literally seminars of courses for new people coming in how to handle the uh, legislative tasks ahead. This is one of the reasons uh, many many people oppose term limits because the problem is when you come in your first year to get up to speed it takes you a few months and uh, sometimes uh, a few years. So in other words, you do the first year uh, type as a two-year term, then you another election. So it takes a few, depending on the individual, to get up to speed, to get the legislative uh, type of wherewithal, and also to get the committee dis assignments. That depends on the leadership there, and then you have function in that um, type of environment. So it does take a lot of time to get that done. And when you are ch constantly changing, you get nothing done, because uh, particularly in the Senate, it's a six-year term, 
but at the same time, the rules are ominous. And even with hand holding for many people, it doesn't work. It depends on how hard you actually work and what assignments you are getting. That's why Maxine Waters has been on the uh, House uh, Financial Committee for a number of years. She's been around and would take over as the chair of that committee. She has the learning curve and understand how to run the committee. But it's part legislative and it's also part <coughs> administrative. <coughs> excuse me. Her staff has had administration experience excuse me, in being a with that particular committee. You go on from the committee to committee. And you see on the other side of the aisle, a lot of Republicans that have been there for some time are resigning and going to other places. So that means uh, that uh, junior members or backbenchers, sometimes not so junior, these people that would be in line, now this is the Republicans, uh, would return in uh, January. But the whole situation is, and we've talked about this a number of times, the whole psychology uh, revolving around this. People are understanding that in places like Columbus, these uh, Republicans are vulnerable. And it could be a knocked off. And the old line things attack Nancy Pelosi, etc. Talk about the criminals coming over the wall. In Columbus, they have very little criminal activity from the so-called wall that's a thousand miles away. And this is what the issue is. Now, obviously, you have partisans out there, millions of them, that believe the propaganda, although they have not been touched on the individual or bases by the so-called immigrants that are flying over the wall or under the wall or around the wall or whatever they're doing, around the border, I should say. These are just emotional issues these people can get involved in. But many of those people are are predisposed to the Alex Jones, have a racist uh, am- amicus to begin with. So thus they're easy to get under. But you have others that in some congressional districts, uh, an example would be Minnesota First, one that uh, voted for Barack Obama. And then uh, they had a situation where D.J. Trump won the uh, district by more than 10 points. That is something political science continue, scientists continue to study. We'll have more on this on a Friday Jobber. It's our magazine program, and the week that was uh, the Boston Red, a part of the Boston Red Network. If you go to bostonred.org, we've started to modernize of things over there, at least as far as some input from articles. We have uh, an interesting uh, one uh, from this uh, nonpartisan uh, immigration uh, outfit that has the numbers, and it talked about this. They said, well, 11 million. Well, that, that's not the case. That's just a broad estimation. It could be obviously more than that. It could be from anywhere from 11. These are people that are... Uh, non-documented, we'll call it, up to as much as uh, 18 million. Now, that doesn't include people that, uh, quote-unquote, have documented immigrants in. You go and visit that uh, at bostonred.org and go into those numbers. We'll start throwing some of those out. And they are updated using uh, standard uh, census uh, surveys um, that we sort of know what's going on. And we're looking at some of the border... Uh, uh, intakes here they basically about the uh, about the same as uh, you've been here uh, nine, uh, 1900 families entered the country uh, legally that's in uh, July uh, this month so it's about the same as under uh, the Obama administration or uh, less so in other words when you start looking at the actual uh, numbers uh, here the numbers have not uh, changed uh, very much uh, as far as, as what is going on at the actual border itself. Uh, illegal crossings uh, plummeted, uh, this is in the 2016-2007, to a 45-year low. And numerous reasons for that, a little bit more of the numbers here. These are from the Homeland Security people. Uh, what the agents took... Uh, they released this on Wednesday. They took 39,953 immigrants into custody during a July. That's down from, uh, what, 42,838 
in uh, June. These figures were much lower than the arrests in uh, March, uh, April, in May, a spike. That was when Trump came into office on his uh, zero tolerance program. But you have those arrests; they haven't been prosec- haven't been processed uh, through the system. Now, some Senate bills uh, been voted down. There were four of them, including one backed by D.J. Trump. Now, under the DECA program, there's roughly 700,000 people in it. And uh, in the sanctuary city, there are a lot of jurisdictions, including Los Angeles, uh, Detroit, uh, basically a, a many, many more uh, out in Frisco, Oakland, etc. But the police departments do not uh, pick up uh, undocumented people unless there's a criminal matter there. And that, that in itself is a different uh, situation going on uh, there. So we have this Miss Jones that uh, we already covered that. Uh, we'll uh, pause for a second for a quote-unquote the proverbial station break. And we're back uh, with Major League Baseball scores. The only This is from Wednesday, the 8th of, of August. We have the Reds in New York. Mets uh, eight to five in that contest. The Mariners were in uh, Texas at a range of eleven to uh, seven. The Pirates uh, were in the Rocky Mountains. Pirates four to three over the Rockies. Rockies have been winning a lot of games lately. The uh, Phillies and D-backs in the desert. Uh, and the Dodgers have left the desert. <laughs> anyway, uh, the, the uh, D-backs shut out the uh, Phillies. Six to nothing there. The D-backs had 13 hits, no errors. And the Phillies, uh, four hits and one error. The Tigers were in uh, Los Angeles again, a game we tuned into. And they were shut out by the uh, Angels of Anaheim. Atlanta was in uh, Washington. Eight to three was the uh, final score over the Nationals. Atlanta uh, pulling it off or out or whatever. The Orioles and Rays in uh, Florida. Orioles 5-4. The Orioles have started to win a few. And in uh, Toronto, the uh, Red Sox at 10 to uh, 5 was the score. The Red Sox had 10 hits, 1 error. And the uh, Blue Jays, uh, 9 hits and no errors. The Twins that were in uh, Cleveland. Uh, Cleveland, a uh, 5 to 2 over the Twins. The uh, depleted Twins. They have sold everyone off. It's worth selling off, more or less. They still have a few to sell. The Cardinals were in uh, Florida, seven to one. The score there: the uh, Cardinals over the Marlins. <coughs> Excuse me. The Yankees were on the south side of Chicago. Yankees seven to one over the White Sox. The Padres were in uh, Milwaukee. Brewers eight to four. The Cubs were in uh, Kansas City, and were shut out uh, by the Royals. Nine zero. Hmm. Not pretty. The Dodgers, a game we tuned into, were in Oakland, and wish they would have stayed in uh, Southern California. Nonetheless, the uh, the A's are playing a better a three to two score. That was a nice game, a good game, I should say. The uh, Dodgers had uh, seven hits and one error, and the Oakland Athletics had eight hits. And no errors, and at one time they used to be the Kansas City uh, Athletics. Uh, Charlie Finley moved them to Oakland, I believe, in 68. And uh, never looked back. Mr. Familiar uh, was the uh, winner of that particular game uh, there. And the save uh, was uh, by uh, Mr. Uh, Tenerman. Anyway, that is uh, baseball. We'll uh, see you on uh, Friday uh, Jobber on uh, many of these networks, the iHeart Network. It's their their app. There are over 800 stations there. Uh, Stitcher, a very good app for us. Also, a new one, uh, Spotify. Uh, They have an app. You can go there and find us. You can find us on any of the others. Uh, We're still... On a YouTube, the audio version, we need to improve that. Um, August is a big transitional month for us, and we're already behind 
or as they say, in a hole, no doubt about that. Nonetheless, see you on Friday, Jobber. Good day.